Turn your Bibles to Matthew 28. We're continuing, of course, our study of the gospel of Matthew. Uh, we're almost through. We're right at the very end. In fact, we'll end the verse by verse this morning, and then next week we'll put the, the whole book together. We, the, Matthew presents Jesus as the king of the Jews. And over these months, we've seen Jesus as the king. We've seen him, his birth. We've seen his ministry. We've seen him basically offer himself to Israel as their king. We've seen the, relig- uh, the religious leaders reject him. We've seen then the people reject him. We have seen his death on the cross to pay for sin and his resurrection resurrection to conquer death. And over the last few weeks, we've been seeing his appearances as he shows himself alive to his disciples and those who have believed in him. We've been looking at those, and now we're going to look really at the last one recorded in the Gospel of Matthew. Now, it's not the last one because the last one will be on the Mount of Olives and found in the book of Acts as Jesus ascended into heaven. That's his last appearance to them. But this is the last one in the, in the Gospel of Matthew, and it takes place in Galilee on a mountain. He told his disciples to go meet him there. And as we look at this, we're going to see that Jesus gives a command. It's what we call a commission. In fact, we call it the Great Commission. It's very famous. As we look at this passage, we're going to make application. For most of you who've been in our church for any length of time, you know this is is our purpose of our church. The purpose of our church is to make disciples, which is the Great Commission. And we'll look at it this morning as we go through it. In fact, as we do that, let me just raise some questions for you to think about. First of all, what is our commission? Where do we get our authority? And how can we go boldly to proclaim the great message of Jesus Christ? We'll see it as we go through our passage this morning. I was in a clothing store several years ago, and I was looking at some ties, and the lady behind the counter said, now this is a power tie. And I know what she meant by that. She said, this is, you know, if you want to show authority or power, this is, this is the kind of tie you wear. And, you know, there's things, there's tower, power suits and those kind of things in our society. People like to have power and authority. And, and sometimes people use them uh, almost interchangeably, power and authority. But we've got to realize they're a little bit different. Authority is the right to do something, and power is the ability to do something. So you could have authority as the right and power as the might. You could, we, we say this, we may have the authority to do something, but not the power. And then we may have the power to do something, but not the authority. And so, uh, you know, Jesus, of course, is, is everything. He's the authority and the power. And as we look at it this morning, he's going to talk about the commission that he gives to the disciples. And, of course, we can make application as well. And, and he sees that, in fact, in this whole passage, we see that Jesus is the authority. And I want you to think about this as we go into this community, because here we are, we, we've come together to worship Jesus Christ. As we go into this community, we're going in the authority of Jesus Christ. And so it's really, really powerful, and we'll see it. Let me give you the outline for the passage. We're going to look at uh, the very first part. They go to Galilee. That's verses 16 and 17. And then 18 through 20 is actually the commission. We're going to see the authority. We're going to see the commission to make disciples. And then we're going to see the comfort, and we'll see how all that ties together. So if you look with me, and if you go back, and I've got it right here at Matthew 28, 10, if you go there, look what Jesus says. He is talking to the women who had been at the tomb, and he appears to them. And here's what he says to them. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee, and there they will see me. Now, we know that this is the first day that he rose from the grave. We know that he saw, the, he saw Mary Magdalene. He saw the men. Uh, excuse me. He saw the women. Then he saw Peter. He saw two on the road to Damascus. He saw some that night. Then eight days later, he saw all he saw, uh, 10 of the 11 that night, and he saw all, all 11 of them eight days later. And then we realized that they, they all went up to Galilee, and Peter said, let's go fishing. And we saw last week that Peter and five or six or seven of them were all together, and they were fishing, and Jesus gave basically some information to Peter about feeding the, the sheep and the lambs. And now we're seeing that they're in Galilee here, and we're going to see he's on a mountain, and he's going to give what we would call the Great Commission. It's really, really powerful. So let's look at it. Look at Matthew 28, verse 16. It says, But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. So the eleven disciples go, and we're going to find that there may be more people there besides just the disciples. We know that this is a place that Paul talked about in Corinthians where he said over 500 people saw Jesus alive at one time. It could be this time because we're going to see that there seems to be more than the 11 people there, but the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee to a mountain that Jesus had designated. Well, what we realize, this is a mountain that he 
told them about a particular place. And we're not sure when he told them. He may have said, go to Galilee and go to that particular mountain. Now, which mountain is it? We don't really know. Uh, some people believe that there's a, a long sloping hill on the north east side of the Sea of Galilee, uh, which, long sloping hill, which is most likely where he had what we call uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And a lot of people think maybe that's the mountain he told them to go to. We don't know. It's a big area, so it could hold a lot of people. But they go there, and, and we see a large number. And, and, and let, me, let me just talk to you about the mountain for a minute. When you think about mountains, uh, God, Jesus was dealt with mountains a lot. First of all, he, uh, he called the disciples on the mountain. It says he went to the top of a mountain and spent the entire night in prayer. And then that morning, he called the disciples, and he picked out 12 of them. And then he had the Sermon on the Mount, which is on a long, sloping mountain. And then he went on the top of a mountain with Peter, James, and John and was transfigured to show them what he looks like as the king. And then as he was coming into Jerusalem, he came down the Mount of Olives and he wept over Jerusalem. That's when he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I wanted to draw you to myself. I wanted to bring you under my wings, but you would not. And then here's the place here. He is meeting with his disciples in Galilee in the mountain, and then last but not least, he's on the Mount of Olives, which is right outside Jerusalem when he ascends into heaven. So mountains are found, you know, it's always something going on on these mountains. And here Jesus went, so told the people to go to the mountain which he had designated. Now watch what happens when they see Jesus. Verse 17, and when they saw him, they worshiped him. But some were doubtful. Well, I want you to understand when they saw him, I think the 11, when they saw him, they worshiped him. This is the response. In fact, every time we see people seeing Jesus in his resurrection, they, they fall down and worship him. And that, that's our response. You realize we've come in today to worship Jesus Christ. Now, we don't see him, but we see him in the scriptures. And so we've come together to worship him, to who he is and what he's done. And, and uh, when, when you see in the scripture, when they see the resurrected Christ, they fall down. But here's something unique. It says, when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some were doubtful. Some doubt it. Now, who are these? I'll be honest with you. I don't think it's any of the 11. Because if you remember, all, he's already appeared to all 11. He appeared to 10 one time, and then Thomas wasn't there. And then eight days later, he comes back again, and he appears to all 11. They've all seen him. They know he's alive. I think that there are more people there. It could be part of that 500 people that Paul writes about in 1 Corinthians. And it says some doubt it. Now, it, literally, the Greek word doubt means to be in two minds. It means to think two things. It's be like this. Well, I, I, think, I think maybe this is, well, right. I think, it, well, no, this could be right. And, and that's what to doubt is. You go back and forth. You say, I don't, I think that's right. Well, I, I think that's right. I don't know. And what, I'm not sure what they're doubting. It could be that there's some who came and said, uh, we don't know if it's really Jesus, or we don't know if he really rose from the grave. That he, could he have been hidden somewhere? And maybe they were doubtful that way. Who knows? We know that when we think about salvation, that either people believe or they doubt. Either they believe or they disbelieve. You could put it that way. Either people put their faith in Jesus Christ to give them eternal life and they're saved and saved forever, or they do not. They're doubtful. They do not believe that Jesus is the Savior. They do not trust in Jesus to give eternal life. And so when I think about the group this morning, I, I know almost everybody here, and I hope and pray that every one of you is not a doubter but a believer that you have put your faith in Jesus Christ to give you eternal life. You've trusted in him and him alone. But here, there's some who doubt, and we're not sure what they doubted. He doesn't say. It just says some were doubtful. Were they doubtful it was Jesus? Were they doubt if he was alive? Were they, it doesn't say. So we just don't know. Uh, it's very important, though, because what Jesus then does is he gives what we call the Great Commission. And as I said many times, if you've been in our church for any length of time, this is not new to you. In fact, I could say there are several of you could come up right now and teach this passage because anytime we talk about our church, we talk about our purpose, our plan, and our process, and our purpose is to make dis disciples. And this is what Jesus is going to talk about in this particular passage. It's called the Great Commission. In, in our church, our purpose is to make disciples. Our plan is to equip the saints to do the ministry to build up the body of Christ, and the, the process is gathered and scattered. So this is very familiar. You've been taught this before. It just so happens we're at the very end, and this is Jesus giving what they call the Great Commission. By the way, people say, where is the Great Commission found? And they say it's Matthew 28. It's also found in Mark chapter 16. It's also found in Luke chapter 24. It's also found in John chapter 20 and 21. 
It's also found in Acts chapter 1. So the Great Commission, what Jesus tells, and he tells it a little bit different in Acts chapter 1. He says, and you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. So it's a little bit different in every way, but it's the same aspect of, of proclaiming the message of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to see that this is the Great Commission. Let me break it down for you as we look at this. Three things. We're going to see the authority to do the commission. We're going to see the commission. And then we're going to see the comfort as we carry out the commission. So let's start with the authority. What is the authority to do this commission? Look at verse 18. And Jesus, and Jesus came up and spoke, saying to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now, let's understand that the authority is Jesus Christ. And he has the authority. And this means the right to do it. God the Father has given all authority to Jesus Christ. This is the Greek word exousia, which means the right to do something. There's another Greek word dunamis, which means power or ability. In this particular passage, he says, God, he says, I have all authority. I have the right to do something. In the book of Acts, he says, I'll give you my power, my dunamis, so that you'll be able to do this. So he starts off and he says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Jesus has all authority to send us to fulfill the Great Commission. Now, in this passage, he's really talking to the 11 and maybe 500 people at one time that he's telling this about. We don't know. But we can make application that this is what we're to do. He's sending them out, and he's been basically he has sent us out. And the, the goal is to, to do what he says. And I want you to notice that he is the king. Look what he says. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. I, and think about that, heaven and earth. He didn't say just all authority on this earth. He says in heaven and on earth. That includes angels and people and every aspect that you can think of, every aspect. He is in charge of everything. In fact, Colossians says that in him, the fullness of the Godhead dwells. Colossians also says us everything was created for him, by him, and, and through him, and it is for his usage. So he's saying, I have all authority, and I'm sending you out. I've got something I want you to do. When you think about Jesus, he is the one who died and rose again and conquered death and gives life and paid for sin, and he is everything. And so Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now, let me just say something about it. When we look at this passage and Jesus is sending them out and they're going out representing Jesus Christ. And I want you to, and I don't want this to come across wrong, but I want you to understand we in this room represent Jesus Christ. We don't represent Stillwater Bible. There's nothing wrong with the church. I love the church. I love it. I love getting to be here. We want everybody to come here. We want you to invite everybody to come. We want everybody to come. We want to teach everybody. We want to love everybody. We want to do it. But we don't represent this church. We represent Jesus Christ. Now, we're part of this church, and we tell people about the church, but when we walk out these doors, we are representatives not of a church, not of a local body, but of the church. Jesus Christ himself is the head, and we represent Jesus Christ. So think about it. He is our Savior. He is our message. If you think about 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19, it basically says that the whole message of reconciliation, we've been given the word of reconciliation. We've been given the message of reconciliation. We get to tell people about Jesus Christ that he is the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. So when we go out these doors, we can talk to people about our church and invite them to come to church, and we want them to come, but it's all about Jesus that's who we represent. And so he's sending them out, and he says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And so then we're going to see this commission. Now, as I said, most of you in our church, you have heard this. You know this over and over again. But let me read it for you. He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all which I have commanded you. Now, when you read this in English, it looks like a command is to go and make disciples and then baptizing them and teaching them. But actually, in the original language, the go is a participle as well. It literally says, going, baptizing, teaching, make disciples. So to make disciples, that is the commission. In fact, that's the only command in the passage. Going is not a command. It's a participle that's called a, a, part, a participle that goes alongside to explain the main verb, which the main verb is to make disciples. So he says, how do you make disciples? As you go, as you baptize, as you teach. That's what it's about. So the, the great commission is to make disciples. 
And the command is not just to tell people about Jesus because there's much more to that. In fact, look at it. It's going baptizing, teaching. And we're going to explain those in just a second, how it all fits together. Uh, Dwight Pentecost, who was a professor at Dallas Seminary for years, he said this. He says, they have to hear the word, so you've got to go. They have to believe the word, so you've got to lead them to Christ and identify them to Christ. And then they've got to obey the word. That means you've got to teach them to obey. And so that all ties together. Jesus says to make disciples. Now, let me just say something. That's all of us. That's not just me. Because a lot of times people say, well, the pastor, that's his job. Our, my job is to train you so that we can all train others, that we can go make disciples. And making disciples involves evangelism and training, leading people to Christ and training them and equipping them. And let me tell you, I know it sounds wild, but that's the job of every one of us in this room. Every one of us in this room is to make disciples, to lead people to Christ, to identify them with Christ, and then to train them and to teach them. And so let's think about discipleship for just a second, because discipleship is different than salvation. Salvation is a gift. Salvation costs us nothing. There's a contrast. Now think about this. Salvation is free. We didn't do anything. God, Jesus died for us, and he offers a gift. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So salvation doesn't cost us anything. But discipleship, being a disciple and making disciples, costs us. It costs us our lives. We take up our cross and follow him. In Romans 12, we offer our lives as living sacrifices. That's not salvation. That's service. And so when we realize that being a disciple is not the same as salvation. Salvation costs us absolutely nothing. But being a disciple costs us our lives. And our goal is to make disciples. We talk about it in our church. We say our purpose is to make disciples. And the plan is that we equip the believers to do the ministry so the body can be built up. The goal is that we equip you so you can do the ministry. And the ministry is making disciples. And notice something a little bit different. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. That's different. Throughout the book, he's been, the original offer was to the Jews. If you remember in the Gospel of Matthew, there was a time that he says, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He says, do not go to the Gentiles, go to the Jews, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now at the end, he says, go to every nation. Notice, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. And so that's the plan. Now as you think about this, and let me read it to you as it would be in the original language. As you are going, therefore, make disciples of all nations. As you are baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. As you are teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And so those all go together. There are three aspects there. The first one is going. We're to go where the people are. He says, as you are going. Literally, the idea of the go. Now, we know that churches, historically, a lot of them had it backwards. They want you to bring everybody here. Bring everybody here and we'll get a, some kind of evangelistic message and then at the end we'll have an altar call and we'll try to get people saved. Well, the Bible says that we gather for worship and training and we scatter for evangelism. See, most of the time they're not coming here. We got to go to where they are. And so he says, as you were going, think about this. We gather to worship and be trained. We came this morning as believers. Now, let me just say this. There may be unbelievers here sometimes. But primarily, it's believers who come together to worship and be trained. We will always present the gospel. You've heard me do it over and over again. Because there could be someone here who is not a Christian, who has never trusted Jesus Christ for eternal life. But primarily, we gather to, to worship and to be trained. And then we scatter to evangelize. So we go out where they are. So when we leave this place this morning, realize that evangelism takes place out there. You go and you share your faith. You, you talk to people, you, your neighbors and your people you work with and, and it, as we scatter everywhere. So we go out to the people. He says, as you are going. Then he says, as you're baptizing. And that's the idea of identifying. Now what that means is this, when, you, when somebody trusts in Christ, you go and you share the good news message and they put their faith in Jesus Christ as Savior. They've trusted in him. Now they have eternal life. And baptism, and we're talking about actually water baptism here because he says baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Water baptism is a picture of what has already happened. They trusted in Christ. They're identified with the death and resurrection of Christ. And then they're to identify with believers. That's why when a person trusts Christ, we need to get them into the local body. We need to connect 
connect them with the body. We need to baptize them for them to give their testimony that they've trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior. And, and that's, what, that's what the whole deal is. In fact, as water baptism shows the picture of our union and our identification with Jesus Christ. And notice what he says. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's the Trinity. That's the Godhead. One God in three persons. And you've seen me. We get the... the, the water thing out there and we get everybody all around it and I take some people and I say because you have put your faith in Jesus Christ for eternal life I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then we bring them down and up. That's a picture of them dying and rising again to a new life with Jesus Christ. He says, as we go, and then when we lead people to Christ, we identify them with Christ, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then the third thing we do is we teach them. Because, see, a lot of people think our goal is evangelism. Our goal is evangelism and training. Our goal is to lead people to Christ, identify them, and then teach them, train them so that they can grow. And look what it says, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. It didn't say teach them all I've commanded. It says teach them to observe, which means to obey. Teach them to obey the Bible. We don't just keep teach people the Bible, we teach people to obey the Bible. We say, this is what it says, this is what we're supposed to do with it. That's why at the end we have applications. And we say, now what do we do with what we know, right? And so believers are, uh, we are teach each other the Word of God. Listen, this verse, I love this verse. Look at this right here. Look what it says. We proclaim Him. We proclaim Jesus. Admonishing, which means encouraging every person, every man, and teaching every man, every person. So he says, we proclaim Jesus and we encourage people and we teach people with all wisdom that comes from the Bible so that, here's the purpose, why do we admonish? Why do we teach from the Bible? So that we may present every person complete, and the word complete means mature, complete in Christ. He says the goal of, of encouraging people and teaching people is so ultimately they will become mature people. They will grow to be more like Christ. That's making disciples. That's the plan. So think about this. We go out to where they are. We lead them to Christ, identifying them Christ, to get them in the local body, and then we teach them to obey. Let me just say this. There are people that, that you might lead to Christ, and they never connect with the church. They never connect with our church. You might lead them to Christ. And here's the problem. They, they may be a believer, but they're never growing. They may never even go to church again. They may say, well, I know I'm saved because that guy, you know, came by my house and I trusted Christ, but uh, I don't go to church. You, look, we need to not only go where they are, lead them to Christ, but identify them, bring them in with a local body so that we can teach them to obey the word of God. It's really, really powerful. And that's what we do. Think about our church. Look, that's our sign, right? Look what it says, proclaiming Christ, that's evangelism, that's going out to where they are, leading them to Christ, identifying the Christ, and then training believers. And that's teaching them to observe. That's why our sign says that, because that's our purpose of our church, is to make disciples. That's the key. So what have we seen? The authority is from Jesus Christ. The commission is to make disciples as we go, as we identify them, as we teach them. And the last part is the comfort the comfort as we carry out the commission. Look what he says at the end of verse 20. He says, and lo, I am always with, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. He's always with us. When we walk out these doors, say, we have a job to do. We, it, it, it's sort of like we gather here to get trained and get pumped up and worship and everything. And then we go out to do the ministry. See, a lot of people think the ministry is done here. Some ministry is done here, but not most of it. Most of the ministry is done when we scattered everywhere. We're leading people to Christ, training them, doing all this. So we have a comfort here, and the comfort is that he is with us. Look what he says. Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. He is with us. That's the comfort. He is the authority. He is the power. He is with us. Uh, we can do all things. He'll never leave us or forsake us. What should we fear? So when we think about this, look at this. The authority is from Jesus Christ. The commission is to make disciples. And the comfort is that Jesus is with us. He is our strength. He is our shield. He is, he is our provider and protector. He is everything. And notice he says, even to the end of the age. Now, I, let me just be honest. When, this is a hard one because it says end of the age. And the truth is, when Jesus is giving this information, the church hasn't started. 
He could have said even to the end of the church age, but the church age hadn't started. And most likely when he says the end of the age, he's talking about the end of the Jewish age. They had 490 years uh, that God promised them. When Jesus died on the cross, they had used up 483. That means they still have seven years left. Those seven years are what we call the tribulation. So he could be saying, I'm with you all the way to the end, even to the end of the tribulation. I also think since he's about to send them out and the Holy Spirit's going to come, he's already told them, don't leave Jerusalem until you get the Holy Spirit. He knows the church is about to begin. I think he also probably means the end of the church age as well. And so we could say, listen, he's going to always be with us, whether it's the church, whether it's the Jews, whether regardless of what it is, he is always there, even to the end of the age. So we have seen his appearance on Gal in Galilee, on the mountain. Some believed, some doubted, that, but he gave the commission. The authority is from Christ. The commission is to make disciples, and the, and the comfort is he is with us. So let me give you just a couple of quick applications, and, and this is, this is let, let us be a believer, not a doubter. What I mean by that is, first of all, if there's anybody who's never trusted in Jesus Christ, this morning, right where you're sitting, you can believe in Jesus Christ. You can trust in him to give you eternal life. He died in your place. He paid for your sins. He rose again, conquering death, and he offers you a gift, and the gift is eternal life. The gift is this. He says, I offer you eternal life. When you believe in me, I will give to you eternal life. And so his offer is life, eternal life. And right where you're sitting, if you've never understood that, right now you can say, Lord, I, have, I take the gift of eternal life offered by my Savior, Jesus Christ. And you can do that. For the other aspect, for us as believers, let's don't be doubters in the sense that uh, we, we're to live by the Bible. We, we, got, we, got, we don't have to be afraid. He's given us all authority to go out, and we want to stand strong for him in that sense. Here's the second thing, which is this is what we do know. Uh, let's make disciples. And that's the plan. That's the great commission to make disciples. And just remember this. I've had people say to me, I've had, had people say, uh, uh, or I've even asked them, I said, what do you think that the plan of the local body is? What are we supposed to do? And they'll say, evangelize. And I go, well, that's part of it. The great commission is not evangelism. The great commission is evangelism and training. The great commission is this. And so what do we know? We got to go where they are. And let me tell you something I want you to think about. You say, well, where are they? They're all over. They're your next door neighbor. They're the people you work with. They're the people you play with. They're the people that you, you, you all around you. And so here's something I want you to think about. Think about the people in your neighborhood and think about the people that you work with. Let's just start, or that you're with in school or whatever. Get a piece of paper and write down the names. Maybe my next door neighbor, say his name is Joe. And I say, okay, my next door neighbor, Joe. And I could say this. I'm, I've known Joe for a long time. We wave a lot and everything. But I don't know if Joe knows Jesus Christ as, I don't know if Joe has eternal life. And then the neighbor across the street, that's, that's Bob. I don't know either. And then the person I work with, that's Ralph. I don't know either. And so why don't you begin, write those names down to those people and begin to say, Lord, I don't know whether they know Christ or not. Would you give me an opportunity that I want to be looking for an opportunity to talk to them about Jesus Christ? Because we got to go where they are. You know, go where they are. In the old days, somebody would say, I want to invite you to come to church, and then we expect JB to give a message to lead them to Christ. Well, really, when we come together, it's to be trained and equipped and to worship. I mean, we already know the gospel. We'll always give it. But anyway, so go where they are. Second thing is what? Identify them. Lead them to Christ, and then get them, get them connected with a local church. Get them baptized in the sense so that the people can see that they know, they know Jesus Christ as Savior and all that. And then the last thing is teach them. Take the truths and the principles from the Word of God and train them. That's what 2 Timothy says. Paul said to Timothy, Timothy, take the things I taught you in the presence of many witnesses and trust these to faithful people who are to trust teach others as well. That's our goal. Every one of us in this room teaching other people the Bible, helping them grow and helping them make disciples and helping them be a disciple so they can make disciples. And finally, we think about all authorities given to Jesus. We go out with his authority. He is with us. We never have to be afraid. He's not given us the spirit of fear, but of what? Power, his power, love, his love, and self-control so that we can go do what he has for us to do.